Oh, it's me. Oh, Is that what we're gonna do? Okay. Let's be inspired here. Scene one alpha. That's me. So Eddie, tell us about your childhood. Well, uh, I was born at Kings County Hospital in November um, 1977, Thanksgiving Day. My father is 15 years older than my mother. Um, she was married to another man. She was separated at the time. And my father and her started dating a couple of years before that. My mother was sick, schizophrenic. She, she, she was, she um, had a mental illness. And to cope with her being pregnant with me, he and her used to sniff cocaine. So she was, they was using drugs while I was still in her womb. I was born fine, um, no birth defects or anything like that. And six months later, they was in my father's apartment. My mother was in front of the window holding me. They didn't have window bars back then in apartments in, in Brooklyn. When I was six months old, I was in her arms and she was leaning, looking, out, looking out the window. My father turned around and she was leaning out the window with me in her arms. He dropped his drink, ran and grabbed me and tried to grab her too. She slipped through his hands and she fell three stories down. Three days later um, in the hospital, she died from complications of suicide. So then um, my father's a single parent now. Um, six months later after that, he meets my stepmother named Frances and he marries her. Once he marries Frances, um, I have a new step family. She's the same age as he is. So my cousins and my stepbrother, they're all at least 20 years older than I am at this time. So me and my younger sister, we grew up in a household full of adult stuff. And this is during the crack era. So during the crack era, you have a lot of people that fell victim to it. So it was like in my household, it was like a lot of alcoholism, sex, Definitely seen, you know, people snort cocaine in front of me. They crack in, in the bathroom where I had to use it, stuff like that. So I saw it all along. During this time, we was living in the Flatbush area of Brooklyn, which is have a lot of poverty and drugs and everything like that in it too. So we, brought, we grew up poor. I didn't have any positive role models in my life at that time because when they was young, they was trying to find a way in their lives themselves. You know, they was dealing with their own alcohol uh, abuse or uh, drug abuse or... Uh, um, you know, sex or their own relationships. So they didn't have time to really teach me or my sister how to become young people because they was dealing with their own issues, which is, you know, as an adult, you understand that now. The only thing I had in my life that was positive, and, and, and my father loved me and I love my father. You know, he, he was alcoholic, but he did the best he can raising kids by himself, messy kid. And he taught me a lot about life. One time that I, you know, no one else in my neighborhood wouldn't like baseball. And um, I spent the night with a friend one time and he had a cereal box, um, Frosted Flakes. In the back of the cereal box, it was a coupon that um, gave away a ticket, a free ice cream, um, a home ice cream, and a free ticket, a mission to a Met game, to the nosebleed section. So when I was eight years old, um, I didn't want to go with me. So um, I asked my friend, can I take the cereal box? And he was like, fine. You know. So I, I take the cereal box home, I cut the coupon out, and then I take it and then when I... Finally got to use it. I went to a Met game by myself. I jumped on the train. So I go to Shea Stadium. I get in. I give the coupon in the back of the box. And um, I go enjoy myself. I come back like 4.30 and no one even knew where I was going. My only bright spot when I was growing up was when I was like uh, 11 years old. And my uncle, which was my mother's half-brother, he came into my life. He was working for the post office. And he loved baseball. He loved softball. He was playing for the softball team for the post office. At that time, I had no one that liked baseball that I knew. I loved baseball. So, he, you know, he grabs to me. I grabs to him. I was his only nephew. Um, he took me to baseball games. He, he showed me life outside of Brooklyn. He paid for everything. Um, I actually thought he was rich, but he really wasn't. But anyone with money was, you know, rich to me, and I liked it. Um, but he, he, he showed me a different way of life, and that was bright spot. Um, my, life, my life takes a, 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 a different turn when I turned 12 years old. At 12 years old, um, three days after Christmas, I think the 28th, my parents threw a party at my, um, my apartment. Now, my mother, who my father married after my real mother died, she was diagnosed with cancer. So the cancer spread all over our body. Um, she used to wear wigs and she was bedridden. So we used to have to wash her and clean her up and, and wipe her a lot of times. 
So it was this one particular night where my father was dating another woman and they had this agreement um, that he could date other women. So this one particular night, he, he, he partied at my house, but he, he meant to go with his girlfriend that night. Um, but he, he, he got so drunk that he didn't. So he stayed home with us, he slept in the bedroom um, with, with, my, with my mother. So around three o'clock in the morning, um, he gets up, goes to the bathroom. When he goes to the bathroom, he comes out the bathroom down the hallway. But when he comes back, he sees flames shooting out of the bedroom where my mother was at. Come to find out, my mother, even though she had cancer, she still liked to smoke cigarettes. So when she smoked cigarettes that night, she was drinking vodka with it. And then in the dark, she knocked the um, glass over between her, her and the bed, the, the, her bed and uh, the desk, the uh, dresser across from her. So when my father went to the bathroom, got up out of nowhere, like a miracle from God told him to get up to the bathroom because he was dead drunk. She lights a cigarette and then she drops the cigarette and the cigarette drops out of my mouth and lands on the vodka on the floor and goes up the flames. So he sees the flames, he runs through the fire, right? He runs through all of us, goes to the fire, picks her up because she's bedridden. So he picks her up, takes her outside. Then he runs back in the house past the flames um, and then wake seven of us up in the house, tell us to get out his friends that overslept, um, that slept at the house, like their kids and me. He got all of us out. Then when he got out and took us all, we all got out the house, he ran by everybody's apartment and then knocked on doors. And, and, and to this day, he never had a, a birth scar on him. But he went to the hospital for um, 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 smoke isolation. We became homeless. So Chris, tell me about your childhood. Well, I was born in 78 in Kings County Hospital. I was born premature to teenage parents. Um, it was, I was almost not supposed to be here. I was actually born in the same hospital that Eddie was about four months later. So that was actually a connection point that we found out about years later and sort of started the predestined love story that we have us just starting out that way. Um, I grew up with a really close, tight-knit family. I had my great-grandmother who pretty much raised me while my mom was trying to go back to school as a teen to finish up. Um, and it became one of those things where it took a village to really help raise me up as Chrissy, as they used to call me at that age. So during that time, I really had an opportunity to spend lots of time with her. Um, everyone told me that, you know, I wore this purse all the time and it just reflected who I was becoming as a young lady. And that was something that kind of really was a, a pivotal point in my life to show me that I was going to be this like independent young woman. So that was the start of it. Um, I vividly remember, remember when I was in first grade, I went to Catholic school and we had an assignment to sing a song in front of the class. And so most of the kids at that time, they sang gospel songs. And so that was expected since it was a Catholic school. But I ended up singing What's Love Got to Do With It um, by Tina Turner. And not only did I sing that song, but I sat on top of a table where my other fellow students were sitting and I sang the song. So that right there was also indication that I was becoming an independent young woman. During that time, we also had the crack epidemic starting in Brooklyn and you know just across the United States. It was a rough time, especially in our neighborhood. We saw a lot of young men you know, turn to selling drugs. A lot of people become addicted to the drug. And that became a really scary time in, in our neighborhood. I uh, lived in Crown Heights section of Brooklyn. And most of the times we had gunshots going off at night. So that was pretty much the soundtrack when we went to sleep was gunshots. So it, it was a scary time. But what I ended up doing was spending a lot more time at my great grandmother's house, mama in Queens. And that was just a really bright, positive point where I could 
feel like I'm escaping from, you know, my neighborhood and my parents, they were great at, you know, kind of giving us opportunities to be exposed to different things as well as my godparents. And so that really molded me into this young woman I was becoming to be. Mama really taught me during that time that, you know, it's important to get your education. It's important to really strive for excellence. And so that was something that was also ingrained in me during those early years, around 10 years old. I remember vividly going to visit my godmother in Maryland. And when I visited her, I saw that she was an independent young woman. She went to college. She went to Howard University and graduated. And so that just showed me a whole nother pathway as well. And that at that moment, at 10 years old, I decided I set a plan that I was going to go to college. And so I wanted to follow her footsteps. And so I did that. From 10 years old, I started writing my plans in a composition notebook. And that really allowed me to, um, you know, kind of set this intention of what I wanted to do with my life. And at that time, I didn't know that's what manifestation was, but that's what was happening. And um, over the years, you started. I started to really develop into this independent young woman, really focused on academics. So it was the summer of 1992. I went to the Crown Heights Youth Collective, and that's where all this, all the teenagers in my neighborhood in Crown Heights, pretty much is where you would go and sign up for a summer youth job. And so that's what I did. I signed up. And, but when I got there, didn't realize that there was going to be a line wrapped around the block three times. Like literally it was around the block, um, entire block. Um, so I had to stand on that line the whole day from 9 a.m. in the morning. I was on that line. My parents couldn't find me. They didn't know where I was. They were worried. I didn't know that they were worried. I came to find out later, but that just showed my determination. I stood on that line from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. that night until I finally got that summer job. I remember my grandmother coming to pick me up and she's like, hey, everybody's been looking for you. Where have you been? Come on, you gotta go. And I said, no, I'm next in line to get this job. I'm not leaving. I've been here all day. And then it turns out that I actually got a job at the Brooklyn Children's Museum where um, I, you know, in our neighborhood, that was really a place that we visited all the time. So I was just as lucky to be able to get that job. And it just showed me a sense of independence and in who I was starting to become. So Eddie, tell us how you and Christina met. Oh, uh, me and Chris met. Um, well, I had to, we had to make a decision. My father, Big Eddie, comes to me and say, "Little Eddie, um, I got to talk to you. You know, I applied for uh, a unit in housing." He said, "In the projects." Now, I didn't know anything about the project. All I knew, all her was, you know, the projects were bad and crime and stuff like that. Because I grew up on this block that was crime ridden too, but I didn't know anything about the projects. So he, um, he said, it was up to you, you know, we either wait and get our apartment fixed from the fire for six months. And that, that means we've been away from each other. Or um, we can say, yeah, you can say, tell me, let's move into the projects. And if we move into the projects, that would be like two weeks from now. Um, where I was staying at, my friends, in my old neighborhood, my friends kept laughing at me. Their parents gave me clothing and all that, but they kept laughing at me for wearing the hand-me-downs or the clothes I was wearing had smoke in it. So um, I decided to tell my father, I'm like, well, if it's up to me, let's move to the projects. You know, that way we'll be closer to each other and I can stop hopping house to house. So in 91, we moved to the projects in Canarsie, Canarsie, Brooklyn. Um, I, I'm, this is when I really fell in love with hip hop and music. My father was an old stone. Um, so I grew up with the old Jays and Marvin Gaye stuff like that. But then hip hop comes and I really embraced it by being in the projects. Um, you know, Tribe Called Quest and all these groups coming out and I'm hearing, I'm hanging around them. And um, oh, I, I, they took to me, I took to them. But it was still rough understanding that, you know, I am a young man into this new environment. Um, I hang out with them a couple of years and then I go to high school. Now, before I go to high school, uh, I went to the zone school. So 
since I picked the projects to go to, I didn't know what projects. It wasn't, it, you know, I, I didn't know where I was gonna live at. So um, I went to Kronosi High, my zone school, in the uh, first couple of weeks. Before that, the weeks that led up to high school, I, was, I wasn't I was a good student. I was cutting class, everything, like even in eighth grade. So when I get to high school, my first two um, weeks there, I'm already cutting classes. Um, so in, my, in, in gym class, um, I met this young girl that was sitting next to me. And I thought she was interested in me. So one day I followed her to the lunchroom. Now we go to the lunchroom and right at the table that she sits in the first table, right when you open the door, it's two young girls sitting on the other side of that table. One is Christina. But at the time, I'm chasing this girl that she doesn't know, her friend. Now they all three friends, so I'm, I'm, I'm following this girl, trying to be with her. But the girl, I found out later, didn't like me. So every day, me and a friend of mine would walk these three girls to the train station, make sure that, you know, they get on the train. Um, but then one day, that girl that I was I liked didn't show up. So me and my friend is walking Christina and her friend to the train station because the other girl didn't come to school that day. So her friend come up to me and goes, hey, you know, my friend Chris, I don't want to go out with you. So I'm like, well, Christina was in the, in the back. And I'm like, why is she not coming up asking me herself? But even from that moment and, and to this day, Chris is a different woman. You know, she is different from any woman I ever met, you know. So, but um, I didn't see that that time. So I'm like, okay, why she needs to come ask me? So I looked at her, she looked fly, she looked, she was beautiful. And I said, okay, um, I, I'll go out with her. From that moment on, you know, I walked up to her, we exchanged numbers, and when I called that night, from that moment on, I've been chasing her. Even in my dreams, if we break up in my dreams, I'm chasing So, um, you know, I, I used to go to her class and give her roses, um, pick up every class and everything like that, hold her hands. And then after two or three years, um, my insecurities jumped in, you know, and everyone had these. I didn't know until I was an uh, adult that I had them, but looking back at it, my insecurities jumped in that I didn't have the flies clothes or I didn't always have a haircut. Oh, I, I, I didn't meet the criteria of guys that wore things that she, that I thought that she believed that she wanted in a guy. So I kind of had this feeling that she was going to leave me one day, break up with me. So to beat her to the punch, I broke up with her like an idiot. So I break up with her, like I think a day before her birthday or uh, birthday night, something like that. And, um, you know, it, 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 it was heartbreaking. And um, to this day, I, I, I regret it, but we needed that to become who we are now to this day. Chris, how did you and Eddie meet? So that summer of 92, I went on to really have more independence, learning more about being a teen and what it was like, you know, traveling on the train and going from here to there. Um, I ended up at Canarsie High School. It wasn't my zone school. I was supposed to be at Boys and Girls High School, which was also a pivotal moment. My father really wanted me to focus on the academics and said that, you know, Canarsie High School would be better for you. So I said, okay, dad, ended up there, went to Canarsie and met new friends, uh, met a, a couple young girls who were also taking the train from Crown Heights to Canarsie. And so that's when I met a few more of them in the lunchroom. When I met them, one of the young ladies was um, being approached by a young guy. He was very cute, charismatic. His name was Eddie. And I was looking at him, but I, at the time, had a boyfriend it was the captain of the football team, um, quarterback. Um, so I was, you know, a little distracted, but I just saw him in the corner of my eye and kept thinking about him. Maybe about a month later, I broke up with the other guy and had this opportunity now to maybe approach Eddie, kind of shoot my shot with him. Um, but I was a little nervous, so I had one of my friends just kind of play that matchmaker, go over, ask him if he liked me. And so she did. She said, hey, you know, Eddie, do you like Chris? If she asked you to go out with her, would you say yes? And he said, yeah, um, OK, yeah, I'll do it. So <laughs> he ended up doing that. We exchanged numbers and um, it was kind of like all from there. He would 
then um, meet me at my class. We uh, became a couple. He started bringing roses to my class. He actually interrupted my English class and told my teacher at the time, I would like to give these roses to my wife. And so he walked into the class and the teacher surprisingly said, sure. And she allowed him to give me the roses. Um, he did that and that just showed me how, you know, unique he was and it just allowed me to continue to really um, start to love him. So that was how we got together and we continued on maybe for about a year and a half. Um, we broke up. He ended up breaking up. I wasn't sure why. And so, you know, that that kind of broke my heart. But um, he continued to meet me and pick me up after my after school job and you know, keep in touch with my brothers and my, my mother and just allowed, I guess, everyone to know that he still was interested in me, even though we broke up. But one thing we learned is that we had several different connections that showed the predestiny of our story. Um, Eddie's godfather lived literally across the street from my house growing up in Crown Heights. I had no idea. And that, um, was one of those connection points. I also, in sixth grade, I, uh, my class and I, we performed Romeo and Juliet at Eddie's junior high school. And while he was there, didn't know that to years later. And then also his godfather, well, his um, uncle was, he lived near my um, grandmother. And that was another connection point where we kind of could have met, but we didn't. And so Canarsie was really that, that opportunity where this destiny finally met us up together. Um, so that's, that's kind of how it ended. So we thought. Yeah. So Eddie, tell us how you and Christina got back together. All right, so we, we stayed off and on for four years. One day out of nowhere, my, my cousin Taya, which is on my stepmother's side, um, she was going down to Maryland. So she took me out of Brooklyn for a couple of days. So I go down there and I meet my two cousins who's older than me. Now, one, I'm, I'm probably like maybe 17, 18 at this time. Um, and they was like in their early 20s. So one of my cousins liked the party a lot. And the other one, I was hanging out with him, Greg, he was settled down. You know, he had a town home. He had a, a nice car. He had a nice family. He, he was doing his thing. And I actually thought he was doing drugs, selling drugs, something like that. I just needed to jump off. I needed to get out of my area. So I looked at him, I said, hey man, what are you doing? Tell me, what can I help you? You know, can I, you know, what are you doing selling drugs, whatever, put me on. He said, nah, man, I just joined the, the Navy. I joined the military, joined the Navy. And then um, I got out, got a great job. You know, I used my GI Bill um, and I just followed the way of life. Light bulb goes off. Uh, if you're doing this and you inspire me, I'm doing this. So I get back to Brooklyn and I go see the Army recruiter. Now, actually, I went to see the Air Force recruiter who was next door to the Army recruiter, right? So I waited outside in the cold for the Air Force guy to open up the, the, the gate, right? So I'm standing there and the Air Force, the Army guy comes by, Army recruiter comes by and says, hey, young man, you know, you're standing in the cold, come inside, right? So I go inside, damn. I sit there, he showed me pictures of, you know, his cars, his life and all that stuff. It's being a superstar, stuff like that. I'm like, oh, okay, just trying to get me in, but I need to get out of New York. I need to get out of the projects. I need to get on my own foot. So we sat there. Next thing I know, I'm signing papers, took a test, signing papers, bam. I'm a new recruit, right? We come out of the um, army station and the Air Force guy's living up the gate. And he goes, hey, are you ready? And the army guy looks at him, army recruit looks at him like, nah, we got him. And I'm like, damn. But that was good though, because if I would've went to the Air Force, I probably would've been off track to meet the love of my life again. So I go to Oklahoma, I'm basically training for a SEAL, cold as hell, never been out Brooklyn like that. Um, and I, and I, I, you know, you physically gotta do the things you need, but then, you know, mentally, I understand that this is a mental game that I need to beat. It was important for me to finish basics. So I finished basics, I finished individual training. Damn, what do I do to stay in Georgia, right? One year in Georgia, I'm, I'm single. Now, in October, me and a couple of friends go to the club, go to a club in, um, in Georgia. Fight breaks out. 
me, me, a couple of them get arrested, right? So we get in trouble. So the next day, my first sergeant, um, cool African American guy, older guy, come to my room like, look, you know, because you you got in trouble, you cannot take your, you can't go away for Thanksgiving. And that broke my father, Big Eddie Hart, because Big Eddie loved Thanksgiving. I couldn't go see him. I had to break the news to him. And my first sergeant said, if you don't stay on the right track, you get in trouble again, you're not going for your Christmas leave, which is the week of Christmas. So I tried to stay on the right track, and, and I did that. But, um, you know, for some reason, I knew I wasn't getting a Christmas leave no matter what. You know, because someone got to stay, soldiers got to stay behind if they go or not. Someone got to clean up the barrack, um, clean up the, the headquarters, do the duties, right? But out of nowhere, he comes to me that week and say, hey, you know, that Christmas week, I think that Monday, though, hey, you know, hey, um, Private Sledge, you know, you are going to take Christmas leave. Man, while I was leaving, I want you to go. Man, I called Big Eddie. Um, I said, um, I, I told my father, Big Eddie, like, look, I'm on my way. I'm coming up there for Christmas leave. He's, he's excited. And I also tell my future brother-in-law, um, Power, which we call, which his name is Tony, uh, Tony Medine, but we call him Power. So I told him, I'm like, look, I'll be up there the week of Christmas. So a couple people know already. So I come up there, so I, I shouldn't even been in New York at the, in Brooklyn at that time, Christmas. But I go up to Christmas, and then um, I go see Power, and out of nowhere, Christina's at the house. Now, I knew the McDeans since I was 14 years old. I knew um, his brother when he was eight years old, him when he was 10. Um, so I, 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 they family embraced me, I embraced them, so I knew them. Um, and then when I'm there, Christina, she comes out the back room and she's just like, wow, like, this is amazing. You know, I, I shouldn't even been here. And now I'm feeling good about myself. I got a gold chain. I have a car. I have money in my pocket. It's not a lot, but I have money in my pocket. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing what I want to be like, look, this, I don't feel insecure about this now, you know? So um, maybe it's that, that that made her fall in love with me again, I don't know. But we see each other and, and you know, when we was dating in high school or uh, off and on, I didn't have a car, she didn't have a car. So we had nowhere to go, right? So now we see each other in the winter and I'm like, you know, um, you wanna go somewhere? But now I got a car, we have nowhere to go. So I said, well, let's go back to my father's house that we see my father. My father always loved um, Christina. They get it, always loved Christina. Um, he used to tell me every time when Chris called, when I came home, I see the call, um, number and call ID. I was thrilled, you know, off and on. I, was, I used to pick up from work when she was with other guys. Um, I didn't care. That was love of my life, she loved my life. So um, we go there, we go to my, my house, and then I go in the back, the, go talk to someone in the back room, my father out of my apartment. I come back out the room probably like 10 minutes later, and Big Eddie pulls me inside out. If anyone knows Big Eddie, Big Eddie pulls no punches. He's raw, but he's truthful, but he's lovable. And when loves Big Eddie to you, you know, he, he lets you know he got to let you have it. So Big Eddie pulls me inside and says, hey, you know, I talked to Christina, and she said that if you ask her to marry you, she'll do it in a heartbeat. No bull crap. And I'm like, so I'm thinking that Christina told him, cause she remember before in high school, she was shy. You know, she had someone come up and ask me anyway. So I'm thinking she's shy again and she asked him to ask me. So I'm like, oh, this is definitely, I'm definitely gonna ask her. So later in that night, we still at a big, a big Eddie house and I asked her, I said, will you marry me? And she said, yeah, no bring or anything like that. I just knew she was gonna say, yeah. Cause we met for each other and she says yes. So, uh, uh, you know, so we plan the next day, we plan to have a wedding years from now, you know, probably like three or four years. So, um, Big Eddie Little Fib turns out to be a big, uh, uh, it, it turns out as Fib turns out to be something that we needed. Cause that night I had no intention of marrying Christina. She had no intention of marrying me. You know, we were still single. We lived, she lived in Philly, going to school in Temple. I lived in Georgia. So there's no way we make it long um, relationship work. But for some reason, the Lord touched on um, Big Eddie and said, look, I need you to get these two together because they, I'm tired of them messing around, playing around. So we did it, you know. So I go back to base and let my first sergeant and everyone know that I'm engaged. And my, and my chief goes, hey, you're not married? I said, no, nah, you know, we just got engaged. He said, no, nah, I'm going to give you some time, take a week off, go get married to your girl, to your, your, your future wife. So I call Christina up, like, look, and, and if anyone knows Christina, she's a planner. You tell her something, she runs with it, she plans, get it done. So I said, hey, Chris, you know, um, I got a week off to go get married. Let's get married. You know, I sung to her in the whole nine. Um, I'm in love with this woman. 
Um, she says yes. Next thing I know, she calls me back two days later. She tell me what we need to do, the marriage license, everything. I come up there. Um, we get married, we elope. Um, so once we eloped, anyone in the military will tell you, even when you first start off, you make no money. You just straight broke, right? But you make it. So after we pay the license and everything like that, um, we it was snowstorm. Snowstorm, we got married in a roadhouse. Um, God married us and she had a friend that we needed to witness. And we couldn't tell, we didn't want to tell anybody because it was quick. So um, we got one of our roommates and the roommate gave us a look like, this ain't gonna last, what are you doing? So our roommate was the witness. Um, we still see our roommate to this day and she laughs at us. Um, so she stands there with a surprise look on her face, not knowing the love that me and Christina have for each other. So we say I do, and it's, a, it's like a snowstorm. And you know, I got a, a 1991 Chrysler New Yorker with over 70, 170,000, 5,000 miles on it. You know, any moment it could go out, right? So it's snowstorm. So I pick up, and we were so broke that I wore my class A's, my only class A's to get married, and she wore a high school prom dress. So we were broke, right? So I pick her up, put her inside the car, and I dig in, I get in the car too, turn the heat on, and I look at my pockets, all we had was two quarters. We were broke. So as soon as we say I do, we only end up with two quarters in our pockets. Broke, nothing. And um, I took one of the quarters and called my father and said, hey, you know, I just got married. And he goes, wow, so him and his girlfriend, Western Union, me and Christina, $50. We, we go to Western Union on a half tank of gas, almost uh, almost on one third, um, snowstorm. We get it, we get to Western Union, we go to KFC and buy our first meal uh, as a couple, uh, uh, a two piece meal, something like that. Um, and we never look back. Chris, how did you two get back together? Well, I ended up going to Temple University in the fall of 1996. And that was, you know, another time where I was, you know, moving on, trying to figure out the next stage of my life. And while I was there, I met a guy and I ended up having a relationship with him for about almost three and a half years. And while I was in that relationship, Eddie would keep in touch with me. He wrote me letters when he was in the army and that um, connected us. We still were connected during that time. But um, I ended up having a really bad breakup with that guy, it didn't end well. And I was in a really deep like funk after that. It was actually December of 1999. And in that time frame, I felt so bad that I really felt like I needed to pray on it. So I got down on my knees and I prayed to God to really send me the person I was supposed to be with because I, I was always the type of young lady that just wanted to be with one person. And I was at that point where I wanted to just settle down and, and do that. So I got on my knees, asked God to send me the right man I was supposed to be with. And the moment I got up off my knees is when the phone rang and it was my mother and she said guess what um eddie's here he's here for christmas break and he's here with powerful and so this is you know he's here for christmas and i said oh okay great you know not really thinking anything of it just at that time so i went back to brooklyn for christmas or my family to spend with them and during that time eddie came with my brother powerful they were friends and he came to the house and I got a chance to catch up with Eddie. He mentioned that we could go out and just, you know, hang out, he had a car now. And so he wanted to, you know, take me out on a date. My father was there and he said, yeah, you know, you, you should go. So we ended up going um, on December 24th, which was Christmas Eve. We didn't know where to go. Now that we ha he had a car, we had no idea what to do. We couldn't figure anything out. But I was really impressed by him. He had this Chrysler New Yorker, which was, you know, not the, the car most young guys would pick. So it really showed me his maturity at that time. And, you know, I just thought it was something that really showed that he was taking it to the next level. And, and it, it really impressed me. So we ended up going to his father's house just to hang out that evening. 
And while I was there, his father, Big Eddie, came to me and he just said, hey, you know, if Eddie asked you to marry him, would you say yes? And I said, yeah, you know, thinking in the future, maybe two, three years, perhaps after we had a relationship again, I said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And then um, not thinking anything of it, maybe a couple hours passed by, Eddie comes to me and he proposes just like that. We hadn't been dating for, you know, three and a half years. And again, I went back to that prayer and I thought about what I asked for. And I just said, yes, I'll do it. Yes, let's get married. So after that, we were engaged. I didn't think that it was real at first because there was no ring. I'm a planner, so I didn't really see this as a of actual engagement but then when i came back from christmas break i went back to new york for new year's eve this is 1999 y2k so this was the big new year's eve came back spent it with eddie at his father's house and then that's when he started telling everyone that i was his fiance so that's when i knew okay this is real we're actually getting married and the next day we started to plan for a December wedding of 2000. Went back to Temple and Philly, you know, after Christmas break. And then that's when Eddie came to me. He called me actually, he, and he said, you know what, I think we should just get married. We've been apart for so long. He played the song um, by Jagged Edge about that. And that, um, really showed me that okay you know what let's plan this we don't have a lot of money we probably won't be able to get married this year anyway so let's do this now and you know start our lives together so we did that we ended up eloping in february of 2000 with 50 cents um that was what we ended up with The message is you don't have to be counted out. It doesn't matter how you start in this world, but it is about how you surmount those tough circumstances and persevere. And that's how we were able to get to our happily ever after.